Welcome along to Live On Air this evening. I've got with me Stuart Mannins and sitting over in Perth uh, or close to Perth in Australia, I've got Tony Kemp. And Tony, would you like to introduce yourself and say something about who you are to our Live On Air audience? Hi, I'm Antonius and uh, uh, I live in Perth, WA. We're a small but growing family. My interests are theology and in particular my new book of Zorro, Hercules and Jesus. That's fantastic. Uh, we're going to discuss this book and what it means in a few minutes but first by way of background you've belonged to a lot of churches over the years. Would you like to tell us what churches uh, you've come out of to get to your present place. Uh, well, I was uh, brought up in the Salvation Army and uh, was there for about, uh, well, until uh, in my early 20s. I then moved to uh, the Potter's House, the Presbyterian, I think a, a few different, uh, the Four Square Church. Church of Christ, the Baptist Church, the Anglican Church, the Uniting Church. Uh, I've had my uh, fair share of churches over the years. <laughs> and along the way, you picked up qualification in theology. Well, I, I received my Bachelor of Ministry from the Logical Institution, yes. And uh, you've lived in a variety of places. You sound as if you've got a South African accent, but that's just not true, is it? No, no, no not at all. Um, my parents were ministers, so uh, I went to uh, an English boarding school in India, an American school in Sri Lanka, came back to Australia, married a, a Kiwi girl, and my accent just keeps changing and revolving around who I'm with. Hopefully I don't that's... get the Aussie accent. <laughs> no, no, that's true. You have not got the Aussie accent. You've got a, a very rich sort of denominational jigsaw puzzle background there uh, that's starting to come together for you as you write this book. Now, in order for our audience to understand the book that we're hoping to launch next year, we've, we're taking one of your presentations that you sent on to me, and I've just put it down to its bare bones, and we thought there were some really interesting concepts that we'd like to talk about, and then we can talk about the book. So first of all, what do you mean when you say that 21st century historical narratives are factual, impartial, and transparent? Well, thank you, David. I, I guess what we're talking about there is the aims of 21st century culture. So in our culture today, um, we tend to be factual, impartial, transparent. Now. That may seem strange because, of course, you know, our, our governments tend to fudge the truth. Media is certainly not impartial, and, and our politicians certainly aren't transparent. But these are the the ideals that we expect of government, media, and uh, politicians, and they're also what we expect from our historians. We expect that the best historians today right with factuality, impartiality, and transparency. And when they don't, uh, they are roundly criticized by other historians. So these are the, the high expectations that we expect of our, uh, our history writing in the 21st century. Have you got any comments about that, Stuart Mannins? Yes, the, it's interesting. And I think I know what you're getting at. Uh, the one that takes my attention is the impartial one. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I find that um, a bit less 
easy to understand than the other two. Unless you'd like to give us an example, what have you got in mind? Have you got any specific example of a historical narrative of this 21st century that most people know? Well, what I would like to say is that uh, 21st century historical accounts are impartial. And so, for instance, let's see if we discuss the Treaty of Waitangi in New Zealand. If we look at the older uh, history accounts, uh, it, it would seem that uh, the writers, if they were uh, Pakia, in favour of it and believed that this uh, Treaty of Waitangi was a really excellent uh, document. But here in the 21st century, when historians write about the Treaty of Waitangi, they express both sides. That they, they talk about that the, um, the European expectations of it, and they also look at the problems that uh, the, the Maori tribal leaders faced as they were signing it, or that they couldn't sign it. These historians at least attempt, if they're any good at being professional historians, they at least attempt the degree of transparency and impartiality. They're, they're likely to talk about their sources and uh, their biases and so on before they actually get into the business of how shall we order and write down this history. But when we look at what you want to say about the historical narratives of the Hebrew Bible, this is where it gets really quite fascinating because you want to say that they're gross exaggeration, that there's extreme bias, and there's copious fiction. Now, are you willing to put your hand on your heart and swear to God that this is what you mean <laughs> in the Hebrew Bible? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What about you, Stuart Mannins? Would you say that... The... Is that an example of gross exaggeration? <laughs> <laughs> well, like well, well done, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> you speak by example. <laughs> There's, there's certainly exaggeration uh, in the Hebrew Bible. And, of course, it is, as you rightly said, you know, history is written from the point of view of the victor. Uh, certainly in the Hebrew Bible, when they attempt to write history, they're always looking at it through the lens that they are the chosen people. Uh, whether or not they are, that's the lens that they're constrained by. And what do you mean by copious fiction? Do you mean <laughs> some of it's lies? I think that is the problem with us being in the 21st century is that we've equated fact with truth and fiction with lies. And that's very important when we're talking, say, World War II. We wouldn't write um, uh, an account of World War II and then include the story of Saving Private Ryan. That's an excellent answer. I, I, I'm totally convinced by that answer because copious fiction doesn't mean lies in the sense that a lot of people today, and particularly in the church, believe that when you say the word myth, you mean a lie. Uh, now, I, I think that's your position. Is that right? That that myth is another way of conveying truth? That's, it. that's exactly right. And I think that's the way they viewed it. Um, as people looking into, say, the Hebrew Bible, we need to go into their culture. We can't retroject our values from the 21st century into the ancient text and think we're going to get perfect answers. Yeah, that's that's very good. This is uh, I, I'm constantly pulling up my companion Stuart here, who takes uh, sometimes a very Whiggish view of history, and by that, what he does is that he takes some twentieth and twenty twenty first century ideas, and isogetes them into the biblical narrative rather than allowing the narrative to stand on its own terms. Am I doing you an injustice, Mr. Mannins? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to be transparent and impartial and factual. 
<laughs> I, I, I think there are elements of all these with their advantages and their disadvantages in both uh, situations. I think there's always the tinted lens of the writer in looking at history, no matter what his intentions are and desires to be impartial and factual. It will always have something of him in it. Uh, right. But the more we move towards uh, understanding the difference between symbol and fact uh, and being transparent so that we can change our minds under um, challenge, these are good things for both areas and all history in terms of, you mentioned, I think, exegesis or a new word I hadn't heard before, uh, to see it with the meaning as best we can find out that it probably had at the time it was written. Yeah, I think that's the essence, isn't it? To try and understand what it was that was going on rather than for us to read back what mm. we think mm. was going on. That I think you made that point, didn't you, Tony? We've got to get inside their culture. That... That's right. Uh, also to, to understand that there are elements within their culture that are completely foreign to us and should not be accepted by us either. So to, to accept that this is their culture, but that it is very different from ours as well. And uh, there are some things we, we might accept, but a lot of things that we would say that was just their cultural point of view and we'll just leave it as that. Well, and that of course is the area in which the great debates are, are now happening worldwide uh, the the battles in the Middle East are, are primarily wars of myths uh, wars of cultural expression um, and so I think this is a huge area one that's really important to tackle but just before we get to that and your book uh, could you guide us through the the last bit of the slide the first slide where you're saying that the archaic narratives, by that, you know, Genesis onwards, we think you mean, uh, were designed for an oral community, etc. Could you just guide us through that? I think when we look back to the past, we need to start at what was the oldest uh, text within the Hebrew Bible. And for that, we turn to... Um, uh, Judges 5 and the Song of Deborah. And so we see in the Song of Deborah the most ancient form of poetical song. These were in uh, pre, uh, pre-script societies. The next generation from poetical songs are communal historical narratives. And they, being mother and daughter, they are so close together. So poetical songs were designed for the listening ear. They were designed to be remembered. They were designed to be uh, uh, as a kind of teaching method, that they were designed to be entertainment. And they were also designed to be insular. They just dealt with their own little thing, uh, their own little society, their own little histories. The next one on, the next generation is the archaic communal historical narratives like Kings and Chronicles. They were also designed for a listening audience. And so they had lots of um, devices designed to help people remember the stories. Um, and they could also therefore be um, a form of entertainment, though for Kings and Chronicles it became uh, a vehicle for instruction and of course it continued to be insular as well so it was still designed to uh, take a story and then rework it in order to deal with the issues that the next generation were facing okay that's that's a really great uh, lead-in 
hmm. to your book uh, <laughs> of Zorro, Hercules and Jesus. And if we then took what you've just said about moving from the oral through to, and it takes time, through to a written thing, what you're doing now is taking something written, we assume, because we don't know your book, something written, and it's looking clearly at images. Those are very interesting figures. Zorro, Hercules, and Jesus. Um, how did you arrive at this unlikely trio? The, the idea was to connect people to what renovation meant in the ancient world. And to do that, to uh, connect readers to uh, a pop culture icon that they could connect to. And so we have Zorro, but the main aim of looking at Zorro is to see how Zorro has been reworked in movies, comics, uh, such and such stories, that this renovation is an integral part of, uh, of our pop culture. Um, from there, it's a jump back into history where I show that even the stories from the ancient Greeks, such as uh, Hercules or Heracles, as the uh, book would be better to say, was reworked as well. In fact, saying Hercules suggests the reworking because that's the Roman variation of the name. And so we see how the Greeks reworked and reworked the, their uh, great stories and stuff like that. And that this renovation was an integral part to ancient Near Eastern culture. In fact, I might even say that if we look at the way that they rework movies, like True Stories, and how they change it and rework it, that that, that is the perfect picture of how the ancient world reworked their own stories. So, so the, the Zorro, Hercules, and Jesus is not dissimilar, you're saying, to what happened from the oral community to the written community of the Old Testament. That, that's, that's really the central thesis of what you're on about in the book? That, that's or, exactly right, that um, uh, renovation is an integral part to um, uh, archaic communal historical narratives, that they had the ability to rework, to change, to alter, uh, and they did it in connection to answering new questions of their community, uh, to dealing with new issues. And yeah, so, so that's right, yes. Stuart, in music, this is not diff so different from the reworking of uh, ch tunes or melodies um, that you've talked about in the past. Uh, so they've been secular and then they've been adapted for religious purposes. And so uh, a very simple song like the Peasants Uprising song used by Martin Luther's, you know, a mighty stronghold is our God. Mm. We actually, we no longer remember it as the rhythmic pulsing beat of the peasants rising because Bach uh, has, uh, through layers of um, music making, turned it into something far grander. Does that, is that what you're... Yeah. Um, art always draws from all over the place. And I've always objected to the absolute idea of uh, sacred music and secular music. I listened to the radio this morning and there was a lovely carol. Whence is that goodly fragrance flowing? A carol. And I remember once I was conducting one of the first um, pop uh, music dramas with taking the pop tunes of the day and putting the music of a, either a chap called Gay or Rich to them. But in that, there was a bawdy drinking song on the same tune, uh, women and wine should men employ, and so on. Uh, same tune. 
And art has always done this kind of thing. It's drawn on whatever can feed its aesthetic needs. What's your, what's your target audience with this book? Which I know is a complex question. Yes, uh, David, I, I've done the, the absolute impossible and almost what would be considered a, a no-no in, in literature is to have uh, multiple audiences. So I want to reach uh, the school children and I want to reach adult lay people and I want to reach scholars and students of theology and I want to do that all in one little book. Is that such an impossible and new thing? Didn't Shakespeare do the same thing? Multiple audiences, surprise for the people in the pit, as well as the intelligentsia, three stories up in the globe? That's true, but um, I've been criticised a little bit from different quarters for trying to do it and been told that uh, if I do this, then it can't possibly be accepted by academia. Um, so, and if it's, a, if it's a book designed for young people, then you know they could finish it in twenty minutes, and that would be it. So, and it, uh, it's it not matter? something that. Does Shakespeare worry about not being accepted by academia at the start? That <laughs> isn't. Don't you listen to? Need to listen to your own voice rather than the voice of perceived authority. That's why I continued writing it. <laughs> <laughs> So, yes, it, it has a small blurbs designed for young people with an option within the book for them to skip to the next section. So they just go from blurb to blurb to blurb. And then the next part of the book is the main text written for lay people. And again, it enables the book has clear directions so they can skip to the next section and then skip to the next section if they so choose to. And then the last section is more of an in-depth one where people can choose to be involved or choose to say, oh, that's far too complex, I'm just going to skip that entirely. Well, I, I take a different tack to Stuart. I, I actually think you do have to write for particular kinds of audiences. I suspect that you, the most important group is actually the young people. It's not the scholars and it's not the academics. They have a world of literature that's uh, really designed for academia alone. Um, I was talking to one academic from Canada uh, a few months ago and he had taken time off to do a, a full length um, feature documentary about people that were living life off the electricity grid. And I went along to review his film and I spent a couple of hours with him and he came out here on a promotional tour. And he said, basically, he got bored in the academic world because he could produce papers, but they were only going to be read by two or 300 other people that were interested in reading academic papers. And this, I think, is the big dilemma. The, the academic world does tend to look down on things that aren't academic, whilst the commercial realities actually thinks the academic world's a bit of a, uh, not a waste of time in terms of its research and scientific and technical matters, but perhaps a bit of an ivory tower for some of the rest of it. And where I see the great strength of what you're doing is that you're trying to promote these ideas that you've talked about uh, that relate to ancient and modern text and image and say, these are important. How do we communicate the, the, the worth of those things, the wealth of tradition that's behind them, as well as explore the new. And that's what attracted me to initially the, the kind of thing that you're on about. I thought, this is doing something different, but I would still 
prefer a, a specific target audience. What your dream and aspiration would be with this book? Would you be able to promote it to young people in churches? That's what I want to know. Hmm. Mm. Um, I would love to promote it to young people in young churches, but one of the, the issues is, is that this book changes much of what we currently believe. So I wouldn't imagine that uh, many church leaders would want to be the book to be available to young people. Oh, that's surprising. That's surprising. Um, having been in a similar situation of writing material, the question that comes to my mind is, because I believe what you're trying to do is good, and my first practical question to you is, have you any plans to trial this material so you can see whether it's attractive and effective to the main target audience? I trialed uh, excerpts of the book with um, uh, a number of different people and uh, various things have uh, changed and altered uh, from those conversations. I have trialed it with uh, some children in order to see if they understood the blurbs and stuff like that. And so I've had some interesting conversations with uh, uh, different sort of people. It suggests to you that we could, uh, if you wanted to do a little bit of trialling, uh, by all means, join KiwiConnection.nz, which has got a small group of content creators um, Stuart and myself are, are pretty primary in it, but we've we've done quite a bit of content creation, videos, ebooks, uh, through to print publications, mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. It's a very supportive community, uh, and if you did want to trial some of the material or say, hey, would you guys like to have a look at a chapter? We'd be more than happy to come mm -hmm. back and mm -hmm. and assist you in that. One of the people watching us put in a question, uh, Tony, at uh, they're directing it to you, and they're saying that they think we understand where interpretation is at, but through the lens of interpretation, where do you see it heading? Where is it going to take us with this new way of looking at things? If you have a look at most uh, uh, biblical commentary, commentaries and stuff like that, there's a small part in the in the first section about uh, Lots of various stuff about, say, uh, authorship, uh, the literary uh, aspects of the book, and stuff like that. And then they go straight into uh, the book after they dealt with all the the other little side bits and stuff like that. In, in this understanding, the literary aspects become the main aspects of uh, exegesis. So that they're not just this tiny little part at the beginning of the commentary which they deal with and then they forget about it. It's integral to understanding the book because the historical texts of the Hebrew Bible um, are literary art and so the only way we can truly understand it is through the literary lens. And so what I do through the book is um, I examine the literary markers within a text. And that sounds like deconstruction, but what it actually is, is we build um, marker upon marker upon marker, and we end up with a wonderful framework that challenges the way that we've been doing exegesis for the last, well, millennia and a half. Well, well, at least the last uh, couple of hundred years since. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe there's a little bit of exaggeration there. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the bias of the author coming through. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, look. Thank you for that question, Peter Lane. Thank you for the answer, uh, Antonius. Uh, what I'd like to do now is say a big thank you for coming on. It's no mean feat to. Um, sort of mm. face a live on air kind of grilling. Thanks for joining us.